All right, why don't we get started? So it's a pleasure to have Dan Wilkins here today to talk to us about uh, his uh, very interesting paper on light echoes uh, uh, from uh, supermassive black holes uh, using iron lines. So whenever you're ready, Dan. Uh, sure, thanks, Tom. Um, and yeah, um, hello, everyone. Um, and thank you for inviting me to uh, talk to you today. Um, about some of the work we've been doing um, on looking for echoes of X-ray flares from the innermost parts of accretion disks around black holes um, and how we can um, think about some of these results in the, the context of uh, strobecs and the, uh, the capabilities that, um, that strobecs might have here. So just by way of um, introduction, um, what we are talking about here is the, the innermost parts of the accretion disks around um, black holes, whether that is um, supermassive black holes in AGN or stellar mass black holes. The, the typical picture that we, we have in mind is that um, we have this, this accretion disk onto the black hole and then Somewhere close to the black hole, we have this entity that we refer to as the corona. And the corona is this uh, region of accelerated particles, probably accelerated by magnetic fields that are um, tied up with the orbit of the accretion disk and with the, the spin of the black hole and dissipating that energy um, into this region around the black hole um, accelerating the likely electrons um, up to hundreds of keV sorts of energy, um, which is sufficient that they will become a source of the X-ray continuum emission. Um, we don't fully understand what the, the corona is, and a big part of um, ongoing research is actually trying to figure out what the corona is and how the, um, the corona is formed. Um, but what is useful about this corona is that it's producing X-ray emission, uh, some of which we see directly as it escapes to our telescope, uh, but some of it shines down onto the accretion disk where it is reprocessed and um, producing what we call the, the reflection spectrum. Um, and this is a fairly typical reflection spectrum that we might see with NuSTAR. In fact, this is the combination of all of the reflection spectra of all of the CFET galaxies that NuSTAR has observed um, with an INK reverberation signal in it. Um, and sort of the key features of this reflection spectrum is we have this um, broad iron K line centered around 6.4 keV, which is the, the rest frame energy of that line. Um, but the, the combinations of the Doppler shifts and the gravitational redshifts around the black hole are broadening the line out into this characteristic shape. In particular, it's got this extended redshifted wing. And this is the iron K line emission that is um, coming from the um, essentially the reflection of the X-ray continuum from these parts of the accretion disk closest to the, um, the black hole. Um, and then the Compton scattering in the disk as well produces this, um, this nice feature that we, we call the Compton hump. Now, one of the, the key features of this X-ray continuum emission from the corona is that it is incredibly variable. Um, now, this means that the reflection spectrum that we see coming from the disk is going to vary in intensity as the intensity of the X-ray continuum varies. However, if we compare the um, the intensity of the, um, the continuum we observe directly coming to us from the corona. And then we look for the, the corresponding variation in the reflection from the disk. We will find that there is a time delay between those two variations. And um, that time delay is what we call the X-ray reverberation lag. Um, and that reverberation lag essentially corresponds to the, the light travel time between the corona and the accretion disk. It's the additional light travel time between the direct light path from the corona to us and the light path from the corona to the disk to us. Um, and we can actually measure this time delay as a function of X-ray energy. And we can measure this, this um, 
this plot essentially called the, the lag energy spectrum. Um, the lag energy spectrum in a nutshell tells us whenever there's a variation in the intensity of the emission, um, it tells us the, the relative response times of each of the energy bands to that variation. Um, so essentially we can we can measure the, the time difference between the, um, the variation in the energy band that um, is most strongly dominated by the continuum for the corona and by the energy band that's, um, that contains the, the reprocessed signal from the accretion disk. Um, and sort of the key features of this, this lag energy spectrum, um, the energy bands that are most strongly dominated by the direct emission coming to us from the corona, we'll see those respond first. So they have the, the earliest response times on this plot. And then those features that are produced in the reflection from the disk, namely the I and K line, um, the Compton hump that is not shown here. This is an XMM Newton spectrum, so it doesn't go up to the Compton hump. Um, and the, the low energy soft X-ray excess that comes from the reflection from the disk. We see that those response times are delayed with respect to that continuum dominated band. Also remembering the, the broad and shape of that iron line with that red shifted wing that's coming from the inner parts of the disk closest to the black hole, we find that the response time of the red shifted wing of the iron line is actually earlier than the, the core of the iron line. Um, and this is because the light travel time from the corona to the inner disk where that emission is coming from is less than from the corona to the outer disk where the um, sort of the unred shifted core of the emission line is coming from. Now with the, the combination of X-ray reflection and reverberation measurements, um, we're, we can actually develop a tool to map out the extreme environment around the, the black hole. Um, the reason this works um, is because the, the Doppler shift and the gravitational redshift vary as a function of position on the disk. So this is um, the map of an accretion disk as we would observe it if we had a sort of the ultimate telescope. Um, and um, the, we have um, different energy shifts, different Doppler shifts and different gravitational redshifts in different parts of the disk. So we have blue shifted emission from the part of the disk that's coming towards us. And then that red shifted wing of the line is coming from this region of the disk. We have the redshift both from the, the Doppler shift of the gas traveling away from us, but we then have that redshift increasing as we get closer and closer to the innermost stable orbit as the gravitational redshift becomes the, the dominant effect. So those reverberating X-rays are subject to um, gravitational redshifts and Doppler shifts that are varying as a function of position on the disk. They're also subject to strong light bending in the gravitational field around the black hole. So they, um, the, the paths that the X-rays take from the corona down onto the disk and also from different parts of the disk to the observer depend upon the geometry of the space-time that this accretion disk is sitting in. Um, and that's why in, um, in this picture, we're seeing this gravitational lensing effect where this flared part of the disk up here is the part of the disk that would classically be hidden behind the black hole. But because of the light bending around the black hole, those rays are being bent around the hole into our line of sight. So we're actually able to see emission from material that would classically be hidden behind the black hole. Now, my sort of sales pitch with X-ray reverberation mapping is that um, these energy shifts that we're seeing are a function of position on the disk. So if we have a I and K line photons and we can measure their energy shifts, that tells us whereabouts on the disk those photons were emitted from, even though for all but the couple of black holes that the Event Horizon Telescope can resolve, we can't actually resolve the accretion disk. We, but we can use the energy shifts of these photons to get positional information about their origin. We then combine the energy shift of those line photons with the reverberation time lag of the photons that are shifted to different energies. So that reverberation time lag tells us how far each bit of the disk is away from the piece of the corona that illuminated it. 
So hopefully you can see that by combining these two pieces of information, the energy shift of the photons telling us about the positions on the disk and the reverberation time lag telling us about the distance from that part of the disk to whatever's illuminating it, we can start to build up a three-dimensional picture of the inner disk, of the corona, and of that environment around the innermost stable orbit and the event horizon of the black hole. So why might we want to do this? So what can we learn by mapping out um, the inner accretion flows around black holes? Well, some of the, the biggest questions that we've got, and um, some of these were prioritized by the decadal survey as well. Um, how do black holes power some of the most luminous objects in the universe? How does that plasma that's falling into the black hole, how does the magnetic field, how does the spinning black hole, how does that system altogether release energy? And how is that energy output modulated over time? What causes a supermassive black hole in the center of a galaxy to become active? What causes it to become quiescent? How is the energy output controlled? Exactly what is that corona? What, it, what is its location? What's its geometry? What is its structure? And how is it being powered? How is the energy being injected into the corona from either the accretion disk or the magnetic fields tied up with the black hole? Um, one of the key questions in cosmology, how do black holes grow and how do they impact the, the growth of their host galaxies? Um, well, one of the... Um, observables we can use to address this question of how black holes grow is the, the spin distribution of black holes. If we understand um, how black holes gain their angular momentum, we can start to understand how they accreted and, um, and how they grew. However, we measure the spin of black holes by inferring the position of the innermost stable orbit on that accretion disk. I mean, there are two ways we can do that. And one of those methods involves finding that in the most stable orbit from the, the broad iron K line in the reflection spectrum. However, in order for that measurement of black hole spin to be reliable, we need to understand how the accretion disk is illuminated in the first place. If we want to understand the reflection coming from the innermost stable orbit on the disk, we need to understand the geometry of the, the light source to make sure that we're getting enough illumination on that inner part of the disk that we know that we're, we're accurately seeing the innermost stable orbit and we're not just seeing sort of where the, the illumination of the disk cuts off if the, the inner disk isn't illuminated. So understanding the structure of the inner disk and the corona is important if we want to eliminate those systematics in spin measurements. Um, we might want to understand something about jet launching, and if we can do reverberation mapping in radio loud AGN, um, this gives us a means of mapping out that environment around the black hole where we think the jet is launched from. So if we can start to create maps of the, the jet launching site and we can understand how the corona and the inner disk are different between the radio loud and the radio quiet black hole populations. And then a more fundamental physics question, does general relativity accurately describe extreme gravity just outside the event horizon? Can we confirm general relativity is correct in the, the strong field regime? So a um, couple of sub questions that can we observe strong light bending actually in action? Um, and can we actually see that, that innermost stable orbit? Can we confirm the innermost stable orbit exists? Can we understand what happens to material inside the ISCO? And these are questions that, that let us fundamentally test um, GR. So on to um, X-ray echoes um, around black holes. In particular, what I'm talking about are the, the echoes of short and bright X-ray flares. So the, the simple idea here is that when we get a, um, a bright flare of X-ray emission from the corona, a short-lived burst of emission, we'll see that emission coming first from the corona. But then as a function of time, we'll see the reflection from different parts of the accretion disk. And that reflection from different parts of the accretion disk will arrive at different times, and those times depend on the total light travel time from the corona 
to each bit of the disc and then to us. So you can sort of see this, this pattern, this reverberation response sweeping out over the disc. And in particular, we can see those, um, those effects of general relativity kicking in when we start seeing the reverberation signal from the, the innermost stable orbit. In particular, there's, there's two features here. Um, first of all, as we get close to the, um, the innermost stable orbit, we start seeing the, um, this, this wave sweeping across the disk slow down, and that's because of the, um, the gravitational time delay, the Shapiro time delay close to the black hole. But then we see this ring of emission appear around the black hole, and that is the emission from the far side of the black hole that's being bent around the black hole into our line of sight. Um, we call that re-emerging emission, um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So that's the, the sort of the pretty movie, but the, the sort of the more mathematical version of that movie is um, this object that we call the, the reverberation response function. Um, and this response function, uh, sometimes also known as a, um, a transfer function, though those terms do have a slightly different meanings. We, someone can ask me about that if you, if you care about the, the subtle difference between response and transfer functions. Um, but essentially, the, the response function is the um, that X-ray emission that we're seeing, that reflected emission we're seeing as a function of both time and X-ray energy. And remember, those different energies are coming from uh, different regions of the accretion disk. And this is just the, the response function of that single ion K line. So originally, these photons were emitted at 6.4 keV, but then from the different positions on the disk, they're being shifted to a to different energies. So we've got some time delay, first of all, between the, the continuum arriving at our telescope and that first response we're seeing uh, from the accretion disk. So this is the um, essentially just that like travel time difference from the corona and then down to the disk. Um, and then the, the easiest bit to kind of interpret here is just what happens all the way at the right of the diagram, where at late times, the, the line emission we're seeing is tending to 6.4 keV. So this is just the response from the, the very outermost parts of the disk. Um, the Doppler shifts are small, the gravitational redshifts are small. So as time goes on, these energies converge on 6.4 keV. Now, after the, the first response, we see the, um, the response from the innermost parts of the disk a fraction later because of that gravitational light travel time delay. Um, and we see two responses from the inner disk. We see the blue shifted side of the disk up here. And then we see the, the red shifted side of the disk down here. And then as time gets later and later, we see the most extremely redshifted photons from the very inner part of the disk arriving later and later and later. So the, the closer you get to the black hole, the stronger the gravitational redshift, but also the, the stronger the Shapiro delay or the gravitational time delay. So um, as time goes on, we get the more and more redshifted photons coming later and later. So what about that, that ring of emission, that flash of emission that emerged from the, the backside of the black hole due to a gravitational light bending, what we're calling the, um, the re-emerging reflection here. So just um, schematic here, we've got the X-ray source, we've got the, the reflection from the front side of the disk, and then the, the re-emerging reflection from the, the backside of the disk. Well, that appears in this response function as this second sweeping line that comes at later times, it starts on the blue shifted side, and then it sweeps down to the, the red shifted side at later times. These photons are delayed because they have to travel around the black hole, but also we see this re-emerging emission, this reflection from the backside of the disk actually enhanced in this diagram. You can see this, this darkened ridge on this line, and that's because that emission that's coming from behind the black hole is gravitationally lensed, which means it's magnified. So this magnification effect, we see it as a slightly brighter flash as the emission comes round from the, the backside of the disk. Now, of course, our real accretion disk isn't just producing an iron K line, it's producing a whole spectrum of reflected emission. So in reality, the reverberation response function looks something like this. 
So we've got the full reflected continuum from the disk, and then we've got all of the line features that appear in that reflection spectrum, and you can see all of those line features essentially superimposed on top of each other with this same common pattern of that response function we saw for the, the single line. Um, but if we've got this reverberation response function, so this is a model that we can construct um, from um, the reverberation scenario. Once we've got this response function, we can actually self-consistently predict a whole range of data products that we, we might be able to observe with our telescope. So given this um, photon arrival rate as a function of energy and time, if we collapse the time axis and just sum up the number of photons at each energy, we get the just the energy spectrum. So that's just the reflection spectrum we would observe. If instead of um, collapsing the time axis and summing the photons, we collapse it and instead get the average arrival time in each energy band, that gives us the, the time lag spectrum. So we can see the delay of the soft X-ray excess and the delay of the I and K line with the red shifted wing, as well as the Compton hump. And then if we collapse it in the other direction, um, if we collapse it along the energy axis down onto the time axis, then we get the light curve. So the, the profile of a single flare. Um, but this response function contains within it essentially a wide range of parameters that we want to be able to measure. So um, it encodes general relativity and the geometry of the space time around the black hole. Um, it encodes the, the mass and the spin of the black hole. It encodes the, the geometry of the corona and the inner accretion disk. And also all these emission lines here have information in them about the properties of the actual plasma in the disk. So the ionization structure of the disk, the density structure of the disk, and so on. Um, and sort of one of the headline results from the last couple of years is we've been able to, um, to essentially use these reverberation and reflection measurements to start to put together a cartoon picture of the structure of the corona, where we have this sort of collimated compact core of the corona that's dominating the high frequency rapid variability and the reverberation signal that maybe looks a little bit like a jet that fails to launch where we have radio quiet AGN. And then we have an extended component of the corona that spans over the, the inner radii of the disk. Um, and we see this showing up in the time averaged X-ray spectrum and also in the, the reverberation response to the, the slowest, lowest frequency variability. Um, and this is potentially um, X-ray emission that's, um, that's corresponding to the, the magnetic fields associated with the, the accretion disk itself, probably driving the magnetorotational instability. Um, but I'm not going to say too much about the, the structure of the corona today. In fact, I'm going to defer to uh, Jingyi Wang, who's talking in the uh, Strong Gravity and Compact Objects group tomorrow morning, who will be talking a lot more about uh, reverberation uh, measurements of the corona. So uh, check out uh, Jingyi's talk. So on to um, actual, uh, actually observing this response function via the, um, the echoes of the, the X-ray flare. Um, and this is the results of a study we published uh, last year now um, that came from a long XMM plus New Star observing campaign of a nearby CFET galaxy called um, Oneswiki One. Um, and the, the reason Oneswiki One is an interesting galaxy to look for um, reverberation signatures in is because it has an incredibly variable X-ray light curve. Uh, we can see there's this continuous high, um, high frequency variability here. And we also see that one's wiki one goes through these different states. Um, we've observed it in brighter states. We've observed it in dimmer states. Um, and this, um, this light curve as well also shows these sort of transient episodes. We see a number of short, bright X-ray flares where we see these short-lived increases in X-ray count rate. Um, and also sudden dips from higher flux down to, um, to lower flux states. Um, Wanswiki 1 shows a strong reflection signal from the inner accretion disk, so the, the new star spectrum uh, picks out the, the broad iron K-line and the Compton hump, telling us that we're, we're seeing the reverberation of the X-ray emission from the inner parts of the accretion disk. And we can measure that lag versus energy spectrum, um, just the average time delay of each energy band over the whole observation. 
Um, and we can see the time delay of the INK line here above the continuum. And just the magnitude of this time delay tells us that we've got an X-ray emitting corona in one's wiki one that's located around four gravitational radii above the accretion disk, uh, where the gravitational radius is um, GM over C squared for the mass of the black hole that, um, that we have in question. But it's these bright X-ray flares that we caught in 2020 that um, really piqued our interest. Um, so for context, um, these are short-lived and bright by AGN flare standards. So the, um, each of these flares is only lasting less than about 10 kiloseconds. And um, the, the count rate is increasing by a factor of between 2.5 and 3 from the, the baseline. So this, this really is quite a rapid jump up in, in X-ray count rate over a, um, a short period of time. And having flares that are short in relation to the X-ray reverberation timescale is exactly what we need if we are to hope to um, see features of that response function just directly in the time domain, just directly in the light curves. So um, what we did with these two flares is we first of all took these two flares and we stacked them on top of each other. They actually have a very consistent profile when you, you stack these flares on top of each other. And then the right panel here shows the, the, the light curve over the, the stacked flare profile, but in different energy bins. So the energy bins shown here are First of all, the um, one to three keV band, which is mostly the X-ray continuum that we're seeing coming directly from the corona. But it also has some of the most extremely redshifted I and K photons from the reflection, but that's a very small contribution to this, this light curve. We have the three to five keV band, which is the, the redshifted wing of the iron line, five to seven keV, which is sort of the unshifted core of the iron line, and then the six to eight keV band, which are the blue shifted iron K photons from the, um, the inner parts of the disk. And what we find is that superimposed on the, the overarching profile of the flare, so we have the rise and fall of the flare, we also have on top of that these rapid variations in each light curve. Now, some of those, in particular, the one at the peak of the flare, just appears simultaneously across all the energy bands. So something that appears simultaneously in all the energy bands, um, we can put down to being rapid variations in the continuum itself. The, the continuum is a broadband component here. However, we see these additional series of peaks. These peaks that det are detected at essentially um, this one at four sigma confidence above the, the baseline level. Um, we see this series of peaks that are offset in time between the different energy bands. So we see this strong peak appearing the latest in the three to five keV band, and we see it appearing earlier in the five to seven and the six to eight keV energy bands. Um, and then there's a tiny hint of this peak at very late times in the one to three keV band, but um, in the one to three keV band, it's not very significant. Um, and what we can do is we can um, we can run through um, a lot of significance tests here. We need to test that not only are these peaks not arising just due to random Poisson noise variations, but we also um, did Monte Carlo simulations of red noise light curves, essentially just to, to find the probability that these, these peaks are just an uncorrelated um, red noise signal between the different energy bands that, that's random. Um, and with the, the data that we've got, we can actually rule that out. Um, there's less than a 0.01% probability that, that these peaks appear due to uncorrelated red noise variability between these, these different light curves. So there's um, a signal here. Um, a signal that's appearing at different times between the blue shifted and the red shifted side of the, the iron K line. Um, and we can um, figure out what that signal is, or at least we can um, propose a model for what that signal is, um, looking at our reverberation response function. 
Um, so where in that reverberation response function do we get sharp narrow peaks in the light curve that appear at different times in the different energy bands? Well, the answer to that is in this re-emergent signal. So these are the photons from the parts of the disk that should classically be hidden behind the black hole, but they're being bent around the black hole into our line of sight. And then um, this region of the disk that we're seeing behind the black hole is also being magnified by gravitational lensing. Now, the, the time delay um, is why this signal appears late. It's why it appears on the, the falling side of the flare. Um, but it's because of the gravitational lensing and the magnification that these appear as um, sharp peaks in the light curve. It's essentially the response function crossing the, the caustics of the, um, the gravitational lens um, system that's set up by the, the black hole. So what we can do is we can construct a model for our light curve using this reverberation response function. Um, and the way we do this is we first of all assume that the, the underlying variability um, is just given by the, um, the broadband light curve. So um, we assume first of all that um, the light curve in each energy band should just be a scaled version of the broadband light curve. Um, and then that produces residuals. These, um, these peaks stand out as residuals given that assumption of a um, constant spectrum in time. And then we fit those residuals with this reverberation model. So we can actually take this reverberation model, add it to this, this underlying light curve, and then fit this model to the, the actual data that we've got. Um, we fit it to the three to five and the six to eight KV band. Um, five to seven here is shown for illustration, but because this band overlaps with this band, it's not included in the fit because it's not statistically independent. Um, but what we can do is we can, we can take this general reverberation response function that we've got, we can fit it to the peaks that we see in the light curve. Um, and that means we find the parameters of the, the reverberation model that we need in order to, to fit these peaks. Um, so we find that actually this model explains these peaks very well, but not only that, the, the mass and the height of the corona that we need to put into the model agree with measurements that we're able to make by other means. So, um, so the mass of the black hole that, we've, um, that we need from this model actually agrees very well with the H beta mass that's been published for, um, for one's wiki one. And the, the height of the corona that reproduces the, the timing of the peaks um, agrees with the, the height of the corona that we get from the, um, the average time lag spectrum over the archival observations, and also the shape of the, the INK line um, in the spectrum as well. So this gives us confidence that these peaks we're seeing in the light curve are coming from this, this re-emergent signal, this, this echo of the X-ray flare from uh, behind the black hole. Um, and then just for sort of fun here, what we can do is we can, I mean, each of the, the energy, back, each of the time bins in the light curve, we can actually fit the, the spectrum with a power law. Um, and then this power law fit to the spectrum in each time bin um, brings out the, the residual in each time bin. The, the residual to the power law in each time bin we can think of as essentially being the, the reflection spectrum in each time bin. Um, and we can see coming out of this, these residuals, actually, the variation of the iron K line and the variation of the iron K line is very reminiscent of that theoretical response function that we've got. We see that that waterfall feature there. Then it's the strongest, actually, where we see those peaks in the light curve. But we see this this continued loop feature all the way through, um, and then this waterfall feature, this reemergence from behind the black hole, we see appearing in response to to this uh, bright flare. So uh, where does um, Strobex fit um, into this picture? What are the, the prospects for, um, for this sort of work with um, Strobex? Um, so the, the first thing I'm going to say is that um, I'm 
mostly talking here about AGN. We can do a lot of this reverberation work um, with Strobex actually in X-ray binaries as well. Um, and this is something the, the large area detector will be um, very good at, but I'll refer you to uh, Jingyi's talk tomorrow to hear more about reverberation in, in binaries. But just saying that bear in mind that we can do a lot of this work with binaries as well. It's just particularly for these flares and the echoes of flares, a lot of the um, the parameter space with the binaries is a lot more uncertain in that it's we and we don't have quite the same handle we do on the the AGN for simulating these observations. So I'm going to be talking about um, the AGN case here. Um, so with AGN, we really need to be thinking about the the XRCA instrument on Strobex because um, for most AGN, the the background in the lad is going to be uh, too high. Um, which means a lot of the signal gets lost in the background. But the, the XRCA has um, sufficient collimation that the, the background is low enough that we can get a good measurement of the spectrum from 0.3 to about 10 keV. Um, and if we take sort of the bright nearby CFET galaxies like Wandswicky 1 or like our Achalian 564, um, we can predict count rates in XRCA somewhere around or greater than 500 counts per second. Um, 500 counts per second across the 0.3 to 10 keV band is a lot of counts that we can play with. So first of all, just the most simple minded thing that we can do is say, OK, what if we did this once wiki one experiment, not with XMM and Newstar, but with um, Strobex XRCA instead? What would those light curves look like? Um, and the real thing that we're winning on here is just high count rates across all of those energy bands um, across the INK line. That means we've got low Poisson noise, so we can see those narrow peaks popping out in each of the light curves at very high significance. So um, sort of headline picture, if we just were able to do the same observation again with Strobex, um, we would get exquisite signal to noise on picking out these flares. However, doing this experiment requires us to get lucky. It requires us to observe short timescale flares that are comparable in length to the reverberation timescale we're looking at. So we need flares sort of no more than a few thousand seconds long in able to, to be able to, to do this experiment. And those flares need to be bright and well distinguished from the the background. So you sort of need low level variability, then a flare. Um, that's going to require us to, to get pretty lucky. Um, so instead, what if um, instead of looking for individual flares, what if we try to do um, the same sorts of measurements of the response function, but in response to the, the continuous variability of the light curve? So this is exactly what we do when we do X-ray reverberation measurements and we make the lag spectra. We're not looking for single flares, but we're measuring the average response function over continuous variability in the light curve. Um, there are different ways we can do this. Um, essentially, this response function comes out where we have continuous variability, the response function is convolved with the underlying light curve of the emission that's coming from the corona. So the, um, the response function will be there in the, the cross correlations between different energy bands, and we can fit that in the, the time domain, or we can also um, extract information about the response function in the, the Fourier domain. Um, and I've chosen here just to focus on the, the Fourier domain method of doing this, um, because this is the, the method we're most familiar with for reverberation measurements uh, to date. Um, and also because the, um, the Fourier domain gives us a, um, a nice way of thinking about the sensitivity of our instrument to the, the features that we're, we're really interested in in this response function. So the way we kind of think about this in the Fourier domain is we take whichever energy band we're interested in, so just taking that 3 to 5 keV band for reference and getting the response function in that band. So this is the light curve just of that band from the single flare, so the energy band response function. And then we take the Fourier transform of that response function. Um, the Fourier transform has two parts. Um, 
we can describe that as an amplitude and a phase. The amplitude is essentially the um, relates to the power spectrum, but then the phase of that Fourier transform are the, um, the time lags that are imprinted on our variability by this reverberation response. So what we can do is taking the Fourier transform of a time domain response function, we can get this time lag versus Fourier frequency spectrum. So the, the time lag as a um, versus frequency spectrum is the time lag as a function of the different Fourier components that make up the variability that we see. So this is the time lag separated into the slow variability, the low frequency components, and the fast variability, um, high frequency components. Um, and the shape of this response function is essentially encoded in how this time lag varies as a function of Fourier frequency. So what I've done to, um, to assess the, the, the sensitivity of strobecs to these features is I've taken our GR predicted response function in that three to five kV band. And I've also constructed an information free, if you like, Gaussian response function, where this Gaussian response function is a Gaussian that has the same mean arrival time as the real GR response. And it also has the same standard deviation response time as the standard deviation of the response times in this GR response. So we're kind of thinking of this as being a, an information free but representative approximation of the, the GR response. And then what we can do is we can simulate Strobeck's measurements of light curves using both of these response functions and see how those, those measurements compare to each other. So at low frequencies, they essentially give the same prediction, and that's because we've constructed the Gaussian to be a representative duplicate of the, the GR response. But the, the GR features in the response come out in the, the highest frequency Fourier components. So for a 10 to the, the 7 solar mass black hole, this is coming out at the high 10 to the 4, low 10 to the minus 3 hertz. Um, but if you change the mass of the black hole, this frequency scales linearly. So going to 10 to the 6 solar masses, you just increase the frequencies by a factor of 10, and so on. Um, and we can see that the GR features, in particular, the, I mean, the strongest one is this re-emergent signal from behind the black hole. Um, this pops out um, quite nicely um, in the time domain. Where this manifests in the frequency domain is actually in the, these high frequency components. Um, but for sort of typical AGN observations, we can see that um, we can separate the, the blue line here and the, the gray line here to about five sigma significance using Strobex. So uh, Strobex is um, really giving us the sensitivity we need to, to start to resolve these, um, these fine features of the response function. Um, so just looking at the time, I think I'll um, skip to my um, conclusions. And um, X-ray reflection and reverberation are letting us um, probe structures right down to the innermost stable orbit. Um, and over the coming years, we're hoping to develop this into a, a real tool that will let us map the, the inner regions of the accretion disk and the corona. Um, and we can see GR in action um, in the extreme gravitational fields close to the event horizon. Um, so strong gravitational lensing, light bending, and the re-emergence of those echoes from behind the black hole. Um, I didn't have time to talk about this today, but I'll just note that we wrote a paper uh, back in 2019 um, saying that actually this um, we can actually go beyond these GR effects, um, the light bending effects in the response function. Um, with Strobeck sensitivity, we actually have um, sensitivity to, to push those response functions all the way down beyond the innermost stable orbit and um, to start to see the, the reverberation signals from the, the plunging region that's, that's inside the innermost stable orbit where the material's falling rapidly into the, the black hole. I mean, this gives us another handle on validating general relativity in the, the strong field regime. I and mean, if you're interested in that, I can, um, can point you to a, to a paper we wrote a couple of years, um, if you'd like the details. Um, and Strobex will provide breakthrough spectral timing capability in both AGN and X-ray binaries um, that will let us make real steps forward in, in mapping the environments outside black holes. Um, so I'll stop there and I'll be happy to take uh, any questions. Okay, th thanks, Sam. That was a fantastically clear talk about this uh, topic. 
Thank you very much.